Here are panelists, people who have participated in this study, but we, uh, some of you are also coming simply to, to listen, take part in the discussion. Welcome to both groups, those who are panelists and those who are coming to, to take part in the discussion. And we expect that there'll be a few more people joining us as the, the morning uh, goes on. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you to the Woodrow Wilson Center. This is a nonpartisan center for public dialogue and advanced policy research. Um, we have a, a wide range of commitments to international and domestic issues. Um, and for uh, really since the, almost the founding of the center, we've had a strong Latin American program. Um, and within that, a Mexico and Brazil institutes. Uh, today's program is uh, organized officially by the Latin American program and the Mexico Institute here at the center, but uh, is something that has um, rises raises broad interest in the center, and I think we'll be joined by Sonia Michel, who's the director of our U.S. Studies program in a bit as well, and our comparative urban studies program here does a great deal of work on, on immigration issues as well. Um, the subject today is Latino immigrant <coughs> civic and political participation. You'll hear in a second from Jonathan Fox and Xochitl Bada what this means, what we're talking about, what this study's about. They'll actually give you the substance of this. But let me just say that this meeting is a little bit different than other immigration meetings that are going on in town. Um, most of the time in Washington when we talk about immigration, we're talking about immigration policy. Um, this is an issue that will come up here today. Clearly immigration policy matters an enormous amount. Um, it matters an enormous amount to civic and political engagement, the subject of today. Um, it, it matters a great deal for the ability of a large sector of immigrants in this country to be able to be full members uh, of the civic and political communities where they live. That said, today's meeting is slightly different focus. This is a meeting about the contributions that immigrants make to civic and political <coughs> life in communities throughout the United States. It says immigrants as actors um, in local civic life, in local political life, and in national civic and political life. Um, one of the subtexts of this meeting is that, you know, a commitment that a belief that uh, immigration has transformed the U.S. repeatedly throughout its history, that each wave of immigration transform civic and political life in new and different ways, that we are in a moment of great change, of positive change, of important changes. These need to be documented and recognized. They're, of course, uneven changes. They're mediated by contexts in different localities. Johnny will talk about this in a second. Um, but they're important changes, and as we look back in time, we will see how important they are, but it's important to take note of them now and take note of the contribution that immigrants have also to the political debate that's happening. And this could not be more timely, as all of you know, and those that were at the reception last night heard from Frank Sherry about this. I mean, yesterday was the, uh, the immigration meeting at the White House, finally, what we could call perhaps the beginnings of this round of the immigration policy debate. And so this could not be a more timely discussion than right now as that debate's kicking off. And this is clearly going to be a long debate. It's not going to happen over two months. It's going to happen over six <coughs> months, over 12 months. Um, but I think one of the things that Frank made clear last night, and I think all people in this room have a, have a conviction of, is that Latino immigrants are going to play a vital role in what happens in terms of where that policy debate goes. And, that, and that's new, actually. That's something which I think is different. Latino immigrants have been a voice in the process in the past, but are likely to be one of the most important elements this time around. And I'm sure this will come up repeatedly during the day. Um, before I turn it over to Jonathan Sochi, let me just recognize a couple people. Robert Donnelly, Rob Donnelly, who has probably just stepped out, is the project coordinator. You'll hear from him later on. Katie Putnam, who's peeking in through the door, um, has done much of the organization for today. Um, Anna Alexander and Miguel Salazar are interns who've done a fabulous job helping out here. Um, and I should also mention two of the people who've really been, in addition to Jonathan and Sochi, um, key to the development of this project over time. That's David Ayon, who chaired the dinner last night, and Gaspar Rivera Salgado, who have been sort of two key advisors as this project, really at the beginning of the project, as you hear from Jonathan, um, but also as it's developed over time. Uh, thank you for all being here, and without further ado, Jonathan Fox. Thanks very much, Andrew, and to the Mexico Institute and the Wilson Center for uh, making possible both this project and also by being very consistent about opening up this uh, uh, crucial space uh, in Washington, uh, really sharing the platform inside the Beltway with uh, constituency-based uh, organizations, uh, real folks, and uh, really broadening the the, the scope of uh, what is considered uh, conventional debate uh, in this town. It's really uh, amazing how, how consistent uh, Andrew, in particular, his commitment has been to this, and it's, I think it made a huge 
difference. Uh, this forum brings together participants in what has turned out to be a long-term applied research project that began back in uh, 2004 when we started planning a conference that took place in the fall of 05. And it's a project whose agenda and whose content has been informed by ongoing close dialogue with a wide array of <laughs> immigrant civic leaders uh, at, and their supporters. And like today, that gathering back in 05 brought together a mix of particular U.S. Latino and Latino migrant civic leaders, uh, in particular drawing from very different regions in the U.S., uh, as well as very different sectors uh, within civil society, <coughs> civil rights leaders, hometown federation leaders, Spanish language media, uh, opinion makers, uh, faith-based groups, trade unionists, and some of today's participants uh, were actively engaged in that first phase as well. And that forum also drew on a series of issue-based academic papers, but the main focus was on prom promoting an exchange of views and experiences among practitioners and, and community leaders to take stock of what were the then current civic engagement trends, particularly among Mexicans in the United States. Recall this was a time when uh, we were uh, in the early middle phases of the, what became the first ever participation of Mexican citizens abroad in their own presidential elections back home through the, the voto remoto. And we were also taking into account the binational dimensions of civic engagement. Little did we know at our forum that later, just a few months later, in the spring of 06, the wave of immigrant rights marches would reveal the enormous breadth and depth of Latino and migrant civil society in the U.S. as immigrants and their allies made history with one of the largest waves of street protests in the history of the U.S. around any issue. And as our research showed in many cities, these were the largest uh, civic protests of any kind around any issue in the history of many, many, many cities in the United States, large and small. One could call this an expression of extreme civicness, <laughs> which meant that years of academic political science research about what supposedly determines civic engagement went right into the garbage can, as millions of non-citizens came together with their citizen allies to act collectively, <laughs> pursuing a shared repertoire of making their voices heard within the system, but outside uh, to a large degree of previously existing formal and centralized organizations. <laughs> For some of us, after spending years of studying cross-border civic and political participation, we were left scratching our heads when we compared the few tens of thousands of Mexicans in the U.S. who managed to vote in their 2006 elections with the many hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions, of Mexicans who marched for the right to stay and work in the U.S. and to become recognized as full members of U.S. society just a few months before. Fortunately for us, at that time, we had not yet finished the conference report from the fall of 05, so we were able to take the spring 06 marches into account in the final publication titled Invisible No More, Mexican Migrant Civic Participation in the U.S., Al Fin Visibles. Though now <laughs> out of print, this report remains alive and well in both languages on the Wilson Center Migrant Participation website, along with the background papers. <coughs> and Moving to this phase, the, the projects whose participants have come together today rep uh, represent a, a mix of, of cities and sectors and perspectives that was inspired by one of the main takeaway lessons from this first phase, which was context matters. Lots of big generalizations about civic engagement trends fall apart pretty quickly when you start taking into account variation across cities and regions and sectors. We could talk about what's going on with, with the church or with Spanish language media, and yes, there are national trends, but looking at it at the city level, uh, things start to, to vary quite a bit. So what does this mean? That even though there was this amazing level of nationwide synergy, even though both the media and the other uh, church were central across the board, in each city, the key organizational players, the key folks who were able to, to ch help to channel the effervescence in such a consistently constructive and propositiva direction varied widely. <coughs> uh, the relative weight of different kinds of actors, uh, the nature of different kinds of coalitions varied greatly uh, from city to city. So uh, in these uh, city by city research projects, uh, we took a similar approach, convening forums where leading practitioners and migrant civic leaders would have central stage uh, across sectors, including a balanced representation of uh, U.S. Latino and immigrant leaders. And to do this, we worked with a diverse mix of cities and city-based partners. 
The mix of cities, as you'll hear, included uh, a range of uh, traditional gateway cities on the one hand, as well as many new settlement cities on the other. In terms of the city-based partners, some are engaged academics based in public universities that are trying to respond to the challenge of making public education really public, uh, and in that sense responding to uh, the transformation of U.S. society on the ground by immigration. Uh, in the cases of uh, partners in, with the University of Nebraska, University of uh, uh, Nevada, the UC of Los Angeles Center for Labor Research, while other project partners are community-based organizations or their supporters, as in the case of, for example, the Pan Valley Institute in Fresno and Las Vegas America in Chicago, uh, SEIU in, in San Jose, or the affiliate of the Industrial Areas Foundation, HELP in Charlotte, North Carolina. And we'll hear from many of those folks today. In each city, we had shared goals, diverse par perspectives across sectors. Uh, but we really were all sharing the, the goal of trying to take stock of, okay, what's happened since 06? Uh, in some cities we saw backlash, in other cities we saw a, a forward march of broadening and deepening of uh, patterns of civic engagement. Uh, the role of local government varied greatly, as we'll hear later. Uh, these city-based forums were usually backstopped by commissioned research. A lot of that is, is on the project site, and, and Sochi will share more background about the, the research process and the engagement with our partners. Uh, but uh, the, my main uh, takeaway message uh, to help to introduce today's diverse range of speakers is, again, I underscore uh, context matters, and to see the broader trends, we need to take into account the specifics of each civic arena uh, in each city and region. So with that, I'll turn this over to Sochi. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today in this important dialogue about civic participation. And I want to take a brief opportunity now to uh, acknowledge all our partners. It was a very difficult process to select uh, in, the, in the cities. We really wanted to have a strong partnerships with people who were who was very familiar with the local scene because Jonathan, Andrew, Gaspar, David, and myself could not have this extensive network that we could like expe speak of what was going on at the local level in so many different cities that we wanted to study. Uh, we were interested about the medium-sized cities and the big cities making comparisons, especially in those that had experienced <laughs> rapid demographic change in the last decade, and also those cities which exhibited very large immigrant demonstrations in 2006. So this is more or less how we guided our selection of cities and then also our selection of partners along those lines. So um, uh, in, the, in Charlotte, we uh, partner with the Industrial Areas Foundation and through one of their affiliates, uh, uh, the, uh, helping empower local people, HELP. Today, Alice Bennett is joining us uh, from that organization, and they help us to conduct uh, the uh, actually, was the first community dialogue took place uh, back in 2007 in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, this report is already out, and it has been officially launched in one of the city museums in Charlotte. And um, this is uh, the, the first product we had from, from this project. Uh, it's, it's readily available outside and also in, in our website. In the case of Fresno, um, we were able to collaborate with the American Friends Service Committee through their Palm Valley Institute uh, project uh, with uh, Mirna Martinez Nateras, who is um, to the, here with us today. Uh, in, in the case of Omaha, as Jonathan already mentioned, we were able to do a um, strong partnership with the University of Nebraska at Omaha through their Office of Latino and Latin American Studies. In the case of Tucson, we commissioned research um, uh, with Ana Ochoa, uh, representing the University of Arizona, but also we did a partnership with Fundación México, a community-based organization interested in furthering education, especially among uh, undocumented students in the state of Arizona. Uh, in Los Angeles, with Gaspar Rivera Salgado, uh, we were able to conduct our community dialogue with the support of the Center for Labor Research and Education. They also provided funds for this uh, study through their community, uh, through, through, the, through the Labor Center. And in San Jose, um, we were uh, helped by Teresa Castellanos and Shannon Gleason, and also our institutional partner there was the Latino Caucus of the Service Employees International Union. 
in the case of Las Vegas, um, initially we were there in um, the consejeros of the Instituto de los Mexicanos en el Exterior, gave us lots of guidance in how to go around uh, meeting our uh, community-based organization in Las Vegas, and finally we were able to do our community dialogue uh, in our, there in, in our hosts where the Institute for Latin American Studies at the UNLV, um, uh, with uh, John Tuman as our main partner there, and unfortunately he couldn't be here today because of um, some budgetary problems that the university is experiencing now. He needed to be in many meetings this morning, so he couldn't be here. And in the case of Chicago, we started working with Enlaces America, an organization that was very instrumental in extending community dialogue across borders and transnational engagement. This organization uh, closed uh, in early 2007, but uh, they were the leaders were very fortunate in initiating a bigger project, which is the National Alliance of Latin American and Caribbean Communities, <coughs> and they became also our partners. So it was kind of a transition for them, and they are also contributing for the final report for Chicago that is coming in the in, in this month or in or in ne maybe next month, and we are very happy that we are still with with them uh, working with this very important. Uh, community-based organization that you will learn more in the next panel. Oscar Chacon is here today uh, with us. So in talking more about the research that we commissioned after learning what were the main gaps that the, of the questions that we still didn't have answers for, uh, we um, identified several areas. One of the papers that we commissioned, and David Young was the writer for that, uh, is the role of the Spanish language media. And he did a case study of the Jai Sobra campaign conducted by Univision mainly in, in California and other states. And if you are interested in reading more about this case study, I invite you to visit our website and, and, and download this cross-coding paper. That uh, unfortunately, the cross-coding papers are only in English. They are not bilingual. But, that to, uh, but all the reports that have been produced so far are all bilingual. Uh, the other of the um, uh, cross-cutting paper that we commissioned is the role of churches in Charlotte's immigration debate. It was written by Chris Bishop from Industrial Areas Foundation. Uh, also, you will find um, the role of immigrant youth in the immigrant mobilization marches. A paper recently written this just this week was uh, finished by Hinda Saif of the University of Illinois at Springfield. And we also have a theoretical framework where you could um, expand the, 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 the vision that Jonathan was offering with you this morning about uh, civic engagement and the role of migrant civil society in the United States. And it's a paper written in collaboration between Jonathan and myself. And um, uh, also we have a case study in, uh, for Los Angeles on the role of Journey of Hope campaign of the Catholic Church. <coughs> uh, we really tried to do a national comparison of how the Journey of Hope campaign had been played out in different states, but unfortunately we couldn't find any, anyone who was already writing on these issues, but we found someone who was very familiar with the case in Los Angeles and in, in, in Southern California, and she was able, Luis Heredia from from uh, UC Riverside was able to write a paper on explaining the context of the Journey of Hope campaign for immigrants in, uh, through the Catholic Church. And finally, each I want to share with you that as you will see in the reports that are outside, the ones that are already out, each report took its own shape according to different needs and styles and narratives, generating products that will hopefully be useful in the local context in which they were created. Uh, as a result, as you see, all publications are bilingual because we really wanted to reach a very wide audience. And um, f the final synthesis is going to be produced in the coming months of this. Uh, we, will, we are going to write a national report when we will compare and contrast all the results of these nine studies that we did. Um, and um, hopefully the, this, um, this report will also be informed from the exchange that we will have today in this dialogue. And I want to reiterate the mechanics of this event because this is conceived as a dialogue among leaders, researchers and practitioners to illuminate <coughs> the main issues and trends going on related to Latino immigrant civic participation. This is not a panel where experts come to offer their insights to the audience without having an opportunity to exchange the many different perspectives in a truly multidirectional conversation. 
So I hope that you can stay with us as much as you can throughout the day. We have several panels and we can all learn from all of us. Thank you very much. Before we move to the first panel, let me recognize the MacArthur Foundation, which actually has helped fund this project. Um, invite you again if you need translation equipment, feel free to get equipment from the back. We hope to make this a bilingual discussion. Para los que necesitan traducción, hay equipos de traducción ahí atrás y esperamos tener una conversación que es completamente bilingüe. I think you'll see as the day goes on, we'll probably start off in English and probably gradually drift into to being a truly bilingual conversation. For those of you that have been in meetings like this, that is probably not unfamiliar. You start in one language and, and people eventually feel comfortable speaking their own language, but please do that. Um, and we have a fabulous panel to start off our discussion to really point out some of the broad themes. Today's meeting, the ideas rather than presentations, is really having a series of questions, a roundtable discussions going on. We're very fortunate to have Claudio Sanchez, who will be uh, leading off from NPR, who will be leading off the, uh, the first panel. So I guess we could invite them to come up and to the front table. We'll move on. This panel has an enormous amount of ground to cover, so I'm going to dispense with introductions. You have bios and your packages. Um, and just to explain the ground rules here, we're going to give every speaker here three to five minutes um, uh, to kind of zero in on what they want to discuss, how they want to engage you in this conversation. Um, there is no particular order. I guess I'm just going to go to immediately to, do you want me to start on the other end, huh? <laughs> okay, we'll start on the other end. Prepared. Right. Um, and, uh, and of course, there will be a lot of time for you to all ask questions after their remarks. Uh, but. If you will indulge me just a minute, I, I just want to provide a little bit of a background or a backdrop to what I view personally as an ex a, a really important point, and that is that uh, as a reporter on immigration and, and education uh, at National Public Radio, I often see my stories as a window to the future and certainly in covering Latinos in public education these days. And as you all know, um, one in five children in this country have an immigrant parent, at least one. Um, they are the key to our community's upward mobility. Um, their education certainly is important. Um, but our question here today is, what kinds of citizens will they make and who will teach them? And most important, will they vote? Will they run for office? Not that those are the narrow um, definitions with, when, with which, which we use to define political participation and citizenship. Um, I'll note also that uh, in this country, and, and this to me is alarming, uh, on average three or four students study the U.S. Constitution in high school. Among Latinos, barely half study the U.S. Constitution in high schools. I mean, think about that. <laughs> barely half of U.S. Latinos in the nation's high schools, public high schools, study the U.S. Constitution. That's the backdrop. Um, so with that, let me ask our first panelist, to um, give us about five minutes of your presentation. I'll be shorter. You'll be shorter? Yeah. Okay, I'll keep you to that. <laughs> Thank you. Buenos dias. Um, I feel lucky enough to be able to talk about Yae Soda, which I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about Yae Soda. Could you, I'm sorry, bring your mic a little bit closer. Thanks. Is this better? Okay, buenos dias. I feel lucky and fortunate enough to talk about the share experience about Yae Soda, having a driver's seat during the whole experience from at that time working in a non-for-profit and moving over and working on the media side of it. But the way I see it is that the community has never stopped marching since 2006. And I think folks, talking to a lot of folks, sometimes try to figure out what happened. <coughs> well, in 2006, we had millions of people on the streets. In 2007, we had millions of Latinos applying for U.S. citizenship. And in 2008, we had millions of people, millions of Latinos showing up at the polls. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the, the marching through citizenship applications and marching to the polls and some of the impact. And, and I really want to spend some time particularly on the impact that we have now and going into the future. I mean, presently, there's over five million Latinos uh, eligible to become U.S. citizens. And some of, the, some of the numbers that we have seen, and I just want to point out one particular area that I know very good is Los Angeles. I think in the last municipal election, 45% uh, of all Latino registered voters were foreign born. And the beautiful thing about Los Angeles is that the county register actually has a label in their voter file that says FB for foreign born. Because uh, otherwise their place of birth would be Michoacan or 
they try to, f other counties makes it really hard to do any analysis. So, but on election day, they were they're usually 51% of all Latino registered voters. So immigrant voters seem to be outperforming Latino voters. I was just looking some initial numbers in terms of the 2-8 turnout and naturalized of citizens by choice Latinos were 28% of all Latino registered voters, but on election day, they were 31%. Of, of Latino turnout. And this is initial numbers that I was looking at the census. So these are the most dynamic voters. These are the most engaged. There's still millions of folks that, given the backlog, which is almost gone for UCIS, in less than a year, we can imagine we can add a million new Latino voters to the rolls. Imagine what that would do in Virginia where I would argue that Latinos were critical in turning the state from red to blue. Imagine what that would do in Colorado, what that would do in New Mexico, and imagine what that would do in Texas. <coughs> Texas. Can you imagine if Texas went blue, driven by Latinos, what kind of national discussion we would have? So I have some numbers I'll share with you, and I look forward to learning from the rest of the panelists. Was that short enough, Claudio? Hey, that you did it for me. <laughs> um, Mark? Thank you. Uh, good morning, and uh, thanks, uh, Robert and Andrew, for inviting me uh, to participate in this and be on this distinguished panel and part of this important um, meeting. Um, so, um, well, I'll just, uh, I was going to briefly say uh, just for one minute about why we're having a conversation about our, you know, the, the influence of, of Latino voters and then um, sort of pick up exactly where Marcelo left off on, on looking forward. Um, you know, one factor that, that brings us to this point is recent demographic trends and, and the really dramatic uh, growth in um, the Latino uh, population in the U.S., um, which increased from just from less than 5 percent of the U.S. population in 1970 to about 15 percent now and is projected to grow to almost a quarter by 2050. So it's really, you know, that, that alone um, would, would change our political conversation. And then it overlaps with uh, a pretty significant increase in Latino political participation. Um, and I think that as we think about Latino political participation, it's interesting to uh, consider uh, how immigration policy helps drive that. Uh, and we've seen sort of waves of new naturalizations and registration and political mobilization in response to the 1996 uh, immigration policy uh, changes, which really uh, placed a premium on U.S. citizenship and inspired a lot of political organizing and, and, and inspired many people to naturalize. And then especially in response to the 2005, 2006, 2007 legislative debate and the failure of, of uh, comprehensive immigration reform that year. Um, which, again, uh, inspired a wave of political organizing that, that we've been talking about this morning um, and also coincided in time with uh, a fee increase at uh, USCIS, which is probably the single most important factor in, in driving naturalizations. Um, and 2007, probably most, you know, when you look at the at the month-by-month -month, uh, petitions filed, uh, it appears in response to USCIS's announced fee increase 2007 was the single largest year in U.S. history for naturalization petitions, with almost 1.4 million naturalization petitions filed. And 2008 was the single largest year in U.S. history for naturalizations, with uh, 1.05 million naturalizations. Um, and we expect that there will be a total of 6.5 million naturalizations during the first decade of this century, which is uh, three times the number uh, that occurred in the 1980s. So, um, you know, it, it's a big number. Um, uh, we've also seen uh, big increases in voter turnout. Uh, 2008 election had the highest level of Latino participation of any U.S. election. 7.4 percent of all voters were Latinos. It was also the highest level of participation for African Americans and Asian Americans, um, so that uh, the, the percentage of voters uh, in 2008 who were white um, and non-Hispanic was 76 percent, which is the lowest ever, but, but still exceeds their share of the population. Um, so, um, you know, uh, Marcelo raised this point about w states where Latinos may have tipped the result in the 2008 election, uh, and I've looked at a lot of these. Uh, there's a bunch of different analyses, and it's hard to 
definitively identify where that happens or not because our exit polls are imperfect, but we would define Latinos having a decisive influence on a state uh, as being a state where Obama, I mean, when you, when you sort of analyze it this way, where Obama lost the, Lat the non-Latino vote, but, but, but the Latino vote was enough to put him over the top to win it. And it appears that that probably happened in New Mexico. Uh, it might have happened in North Carolina uh, and Indiana and Nevada. Um, only New Mexico definitively appears to fall into that category. Um, but, but I think that um, you know, two, two things cause us to realize that, that the Latino influence is, is bigger than, than, than those four states. And one is to think about the impact farther down the ballot. So, you know, look at the Franken election in Minnesota, you know. Uh, there's a lot of close elections and, and Latinos broke heavily Democratic in, in, you know, essentially all of them. Um, and then also to think about um, as we go forward, um, well, a, a second factor is to think about not just the thought experiment of taking away Latino voters, but of what happens if those voters continue to, to vote uh, or to break more heavily for, uh, towards Democratic candidates. Um, so in the 2008 election, about two-thirds went for Obama. You know, if the Republican Party um, were to sort of give up on Latino voters um, or, if, or if the politics of the immigration debate were to drive Latino voters more heavily into the Democratic camp, um, then, you know, that would put, uh, that, that would make a difference in states potentially like Texas and Arizona and Georgia and, um, you know, a lot of states that we think of as reliably red have uh, growing, large and growing Latino populations and, and to move them into the Democratic camp rather than to take them out of the electorate uh, causes those states to tip more quickly. Um, so uh, just um, with one more minute, let me just um, mention a couple of factors that weigh in the other direction. One is that uh, Latino political participation is still low uh, relative to other groups. Um, uh, only about um, Latino, turn up in, Latino turnout in 2008 increased to 49.9 percent, still fewer than half of Latinos in the, who are eligible vote. Um, uh, naturalization rates are still um, lower than they could be. There's a lot of eligible Latinos who have, or eligible immigrants who have not naturalized. Mexicans are particularly unlikely to naturalize. Um, uh, uh, legal immigrants who benefit from, from legalization programs in 1986 and previous legalizations have been particularly unlikely to, to um, naturalize. Um, so uh, looking forward, um, there's a big remaining education gap income gap, all of these things mitigate against uh, Latinos being as influential as they could be. Um, I think as we think about questions, a couple things we might talk about today that, that, would, that would sort of shape the future of Latinos' influence. Um, the political identity and, and you know, the extent to which Latinos identify as a political bloc versus distinct national blocs uh, and, and the sort of complex relationship between assimilation and political identity. So. Uh, as, as Latinos become more influential through assimilation, they may become less uh, of a cohesive sort of and, and self-identifying voting bloc. Um, uh, the role that the immigration debate will play in, um, you know, one way to think about the, the immigration debate has been, or immigration policy has been described as a civil rights issue for this era. Uh, one way in which that may or may not be true is uh, the way it continues to create uh, political identity and to mobilize Latinos to enter into politics. Um, and then also how the Republican Party responds to um, the opportunity uh, and, the, and, the, you know, and the complexity of the immigration debate. I think all of those things are important sort of factors that, that we'll look to moving forward. Okay, thank you. Oscar Chacon. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation uh, and the opportunity to collaborate with the Wilson Center in this very important uh, project. A um, couple of words about NALAC, uh, and I would invite everybody to just check us out at www.nalacc.org, uh, since I don't have much time to, to uh, speak about it. But let me just quickly say that we are, at least so far, the only national Latino immigrant organization in the United States. And that's something I say you know, with uh, a sense of pride, but also with a sense of concern, because the bottom line is, with the growth of Latino immigrants in this country, particularly Mexican, Central American, 
Caribbean immigrants, uh, I would wish, I mean, there were more organizations advancing from a very uh, self-generated uh, effort, uh, more empowerment agendas uh, by Latino immigrants uh, in the U.S. I think that it's important to understand that uh, the nature of civic and political engagement in the U.S., you know, seen by Latino immigrants ourselves, it's not just an, un an enterprise, I mean, that we understand as one only applicable to the United States of America. And I think that that's a very important piece that I'd like to contribute to this particular uh, portion of the discussion today. For us, civic engagement and political participation, it's at least a two-level uh, challenge. On one hand, of course, we want to participate politically, we want to participate civically in the U.S., and as the two previous speakers already uh, uh, put in evidence, uh, we are certainly moving along you know, in that path. But at the same time, we understand that because of the proximity, because of the very close links um, that many of us keep you know, with our countries of origin, we also understand the challenge of civic and political participation as one that relates to the country of origin, whether that is you know, Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, the Dominican Republic, Brazil, et cetera. And that's in itself a very particular characteristic of Latino immigrants in recent times. Because the normal assumption is that we should just be concerned about becoming engaged in the U.S. political arena. And again, we don't deny, I mean, the importance of that. But in addition to that, we also believe it is important to engage in that other transnational arena of civic and political participation. And that is a, a, an arena that relates at least, you know, to three different spaces where we see a lot of potential for Latino immigrants to become more significant players. On one hand, of course, advancing specific advocacy agendas in relationship to country of origin uh, politics, policies, but we also believe it is important to understand the uh, role of international political and financial multilateral institutions. In our case, of particular importance would be the Organization of American States and the Inter-American Development Bank, just to mention two institutions. And the third level where we see also a tremendous potential for Latino immigrants to make a very significant contribution is the area of U.S. foreign policy towards Latin America. Because as it is well known, foreign policy altogether, it's a field of public policy in which U.S. society as a whole participates very little. But we believe that that's an opportunity for Latino immigrants to also diversify you know, the field of advocates uh, that operate in that particular arena uh, and where we look forward to making contributions. In as far as the greatest challenges uh, that confront you know, the processes in which Latino Caribbean immigrants are engaged in terms of civic participation, political participation. Let me mention just a couple of them uh, which I believe are very important. First of all, it is true, you know, that we have been driving in very many ways, you know, the growth of Latinos in the U.S. It is true that we are driving in many ways the growth in the number of Latinos that are registered to become voters and people who actually vote. I completely agree that we still have a long way to go in as far as improving the, the rates of participation in elections. It's not enough to register millions of Latinos. The ultimate challenge is how do we get them to the ballot box and actually cast a ballot on election day. Uh, but I also believe that these changes also generate fear. I mean, the fact that we are driving the changing face of America still generates very dangerous fears at the local level and at the federal level. And that presents clearly a challenge because on one hand, we want to indeed push people to become more engaged, but at the same time, we still have a system that in many ways rejects you know, the role of contribution that Latino immigrants in particular have to provide uh, to our changing America. Second of all, uh, I think that there is a huge challenge to overcome in terms of generating the capacity to secure access to resources that can more effectively support self-generated empowerment organizing processes within Latino immigrant communities. If you take a look at, for example, the immigration advocacy field, uh, clearly, I mean, the way 
dollars are distributed just from the philanthropic community uh, still are very, very unbalanced. I mean, in terms of how much money is actually going to Latino immigrant-led organizations. And consequently, the capacity for us to project our voice on national policy issues remains rather weak. I would leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. And now with uh, Esther Olavarria. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to focus my remarks on, on the challenges that, that Latinos face in, in becoming more fully engaged civically and politically. Um, I think the first challenge is, is education. Um, we have um, a significant number of, of the um, Latino population, um, especially the undocumented population, um, has less than a high school degree, <coughs> a high school diploma. Latino youth have troublingly high dropout rates, all very, very um, um, troubling when you think about all of the skills that you need to engage politically and civically. Um, the numbers of Latino it's in, in college are low compared to, to the, the percentage of the population, and even lower when you look at Latinos seeking advanced degrees, masters, um, PhDs, law degrees, um, and, and the like. Um, and all of this impedes um, their ability. Um, Tied to this um, is uh, many Latinos, as, as we all know, um, are in low-skilled occupations, sometimes working two jobs or more. It's very hard to become civically and politically engaged when you're trying to, to, to make a living to um, you know, survive and, and, um, and um, pay your rent and so forth. There's, there's very little time left, and the time that you do have, you end up probably enrolling in, in English classes and the like to improve your, your skills to be able to get better jobs. So it's all of those are challenges. There, there are few Latinos in, in, in government right now as role models. So um, it's, it's, if you don't have a role model, it's hard to aspire um, to something. We, we see it in, in, in the Congress. Um, where um, we have very few numbers um, in, in the Senate. Right now, I guess it's two, it had been three. Um, I don't know the number in the House of Representatives. Um, we've, we've seen more and more Latinos become involved in government at the state and local levels, but that still hasn't reached the federal levels. One of the challenges um, in the Obama administration was trying to identify um, Latinos um, for leadership positions in key posts. I mean, they, the, we have had some that have been named, but we could have had more if we had a greater pool. Um, in my own experience when I was in, in the Senate, the number of Latinos um, working in, in, in the Congress as staffers was a handful. Uh, I think maybe in the Senate at one time there were five and two of them were in Senator Kennedy's office. Um, so it's, again, it's, it's hard to motivate people and have role models if there are no role models out there. Um, another challenge tied to this is immigration status. Um, we, are, the other speakers have talked about naturalization rates and, and how um, the numbers of Latinos naturalizing ha have increased, and especially the numbers of Mexicans naturalizing over the last years have increased significantly, but there's still a lot to be done. Um, USCIS has, has recently, a month or two ago, promoted, um, started a program to promote citizenship um, and has been targeting uh, the states where there are the, the most um, permanent residents eligible for naturalization. Um, Texas, California, Florida, New York, Illinois. But that's a program that has recently started and there's a lot of work to be done. And they have made available or are making available um, funds um, for organizations uh, like Oscars and, and, and others to, um, to promote citizenship um, uh, civic classes, ESL classes, and the like. But, but still, the funding is small. We need to continue to build it. But in, in this economic climate, it's hard to find that kind of money. Um, the, but the, 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 the biggest obstacle, I think, is, is um, lack of um, legal status for the undocumented. Of, as you all well know, of the 12 million or so undocumented, um, 75 to 80 percent of them are, are Latinos. And, and it's hard to, um, and without, the, without having legal status, it's almost impossible to become, well, it is impossible to become politically um, involved um, and, and, and very difficult to become civically involved. You, you, you live in the shadows. Um, you're, you're afraid um, to come into contact with the authorities. You, you all know um, the problems. 
Um, family backlogs are another impediment. A significant number of, of, uh, of the um, family backlog petitions are, are petitions filed by um, Latino permanent residents uh, and, and citizens for, for their relatives, and they languish for years and years because of um, uh, very few numbers available. And so we need reforms in, in those categories in addition to the re um, some kind of legal program um, to, to, um, le um, to provide legal status to the undocumented. I um, want to just leave it with some, um, I had the um, um, honor of being president at the meeting the president held yesterday with the members of Congress and, and the secretary and wanted to just talk very briefly about that. Um, there were something like um, 30 members of Congress there, uh, both uh, chambers, both parties, all sides of the issue. Um, Secretary Napolitano was there, Secretary Solis, and, and Deputy Attorney General Ogden. The President um, started the discussion uh, making perfectly clear that immigration reform is a top priority for him and he wants to um, move to this either sometime later this year or beginning of next year. Uh, he named Secretary Napolitano as his designee to, to start the negotiations with, with the members of Congress. And the discussions around the room were, were all very hopeful. We all know how difficult this is going to be. Um, we all know that it has to be bipartisan to succeed, but most of the members in the room, in, in, all par in both parties, were, seemed to be willing to roll up their sleeves and, and get to work, um, with very few exceptions. Um, there are big differences that still need to be worked out with respect to how you legalize the undocumented, whether you have a temporary worker program or commission, lots of different things. But, but I was cautiously optimistic by, by the energy and the commitment in the room. Thank you. So let's begin this conversation. Um, and just as a ground rule, we'll ask you to please, I will plead with you not to make speeches, just ask a question. Um, and also, uh, identify yourself, tell us who you are, who you represent, or if you're just here on your own. Let me begin, and so we'll get to that in a second. I, I'm really curious, though, I mean, I'm glad Esther brought up the, what I consider one of the elephants in the room, which is um, legal status in this country. But there's another one, and that is English language fluency. Researchers have said repeatedly there's been a dramatic shift in English language fluency among even first generation immigrants. And I was surprised to hear also recently that 44% of both foreign born and US born uh, Latino immigrants are bilingual, con consider themselves bilingual. And I guess I want to just throw out a question about, um, because in fact, you know, Latinos often say uh, that discrimination against them is not so much a function of poor, uh, of, of skin color, income, education, or even immigrant status. It's often because they don't speak English. That's why many report that they're discriminated. So I'm wondering, how does language, English language fluency certainly um, play, I mean, how does it play out given all that we've heard here about participation, about political identity, and so forth? Anybody want to tackle that question? Then we'll go to the honors. I'll tackle it from the elections perspective. Um, in this presidential election, I work for a media company, and we had properties in Colorado, Nevada, Nuevo Mexico, Orlando, and Tampa. So you can imagine we were battleground city for all the Latinos. And if you look at the, the amount of dollars spent on Latinos compared to the general language, it was minuscule. I you, mean, you mean on Spanish language media? Spanish language okay. media. And, and in terms of, I mean, in terms of uh, both in the primary and the general, <coughs> where you have a, a growing community, because the argument is from, from political operatives and consultants is, well, significant numbers of Latinos speak English, so we're getting most of Latinos. And for the Spanish speakers, and the way I explain it to folks, if you're a bilingual Latino, your source of information goes from CNN to Univision. But if you're a Spanish dominant, monolingual Spanish speakers, your source of information and connection to the political world is much more reduced. And for significant numbers of that population during this election cycle, on top of all that talk, it wasn't significant. And you know, just one example, the president's 30-minute commercial. I don't know if we all saw it. Uh, 
beautifully done, but it had subtitles in Spanish, not even a voiceover. Um, and given, given literacy rates, I wonder how effective that was. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anybody else? Yes, I'd like to quickly add, uh, I, th I think that you know, we have not had, and this is something that the panelists here know very well, I mean, we haven't had as a nation so far a national immigrants policy. So the degree of investment in terms of getting people to have access, you know, to learning English hasn't really been plentiful. I mean, and that's important not to lose perspective of. Uh, second of all, I think that we have a, a rather complicated situation because on one hand, many Latino immigrants, as Esther well said, have to work two, sometimes three jobs. So the possibility for them to actually have time to learn English is very limited, you know, because of the realities of their employment you know, patterns. Uh, third, I think that there is a reality that we also need to acknowledge. A lot of Latino immigrants do not feel appreciated you know, in society, do not feel welcome. And as a result, they resist you know, the idea of learning English because keeping uh, Spanish as the main language that they go about with, it's almost a matter of pride. I mean, and this is something that we need to also come to grips uh, with. I think that the more we can advance to make uh, Latino immigrants, in particular Mexican immigrants, really feel acknowledged for what they really are, which I always say a blessing for the country, you know, the easier it will be uh, for them to become much more able you know, to indeed uh, learn English. And the last comment I would make about this is, it's completely different when you talk about the children of immigrants. Because by and large, the children of immigrants are very capable of being, at the very least, bilingual and sometimes, unfortunately, mostly monolingual in English. If I could <coughs> add, tied to this um, is the, the lack of ESL classes available around the country. Um, lots of Latinos are willing to make the sacrifices to attend English classes, but when, when Mark and I were working on, on the immigration bills in 2006 and 2007, we did a survey of, of um, ESL classes around the country, and, and the waiting rates were alarming. I mean, in some, in some cities, they were two to three years to get into a class. Um, and it also goes back to um, Oscar's point, is we haven't had a, a national emphasis on 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 um, immigrant integration and, and and funding significant funding available to for for ESL for, for civics classes, um, and we need to think creatively about how that can be done. I know a number of organizations, Mark's um, current organization, in fact, is doing that, but exploring ways to maybe have English classes available at at, at work sites, um, things like that. We need to we need to really find ways to expand that. I will note, by the way, that up until 1968, we did not have, this nation never even tried to have a language policy. But remember, 1968, Congress passed the 1968 Bilingual Education Act, which essentially opened the doors to bilingual education and that old debate. Uh, that has essentially been dismantled with the passage of No Child Left Behind, just as a note of reference. There's a question here. Um, uh, you had a question, and then I guess we'll pick and choose here. We'll go there next. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Michael Klein, and I'm a student activist in Nevada. And speaking about the English, um, I know, especially when I was in high school, the the English classes for first first generation Im Im immigrant students was very. They graduated with the with a, a diploma, but they for them to go to college and succeed in college was they, they did not have the the, the English skills required. What what is that? What, what do you guys think would? Well, what type of policies? I mean, you're talking about the difference between just the vernacular versus the academic English you need to write an essay to function in a school, that kind of thing. Yes, exactly. I mean, I'll say one. This is not an area that, that I have a lot of expertise in, but um, I'll just uh, comment on, on something I, I heard. I mean, I think Cla Claudia brought up No Child Left Behind, and and it specifically uh, addresses you know, uh, four different sort of subgroups of students, including ESL students, and, and you know, one of the things that, that people on the left and right 
often like about No Child Left Behind is that it requires, you know, improvements within each of those subgroups and and um, and, and and sort of specific sort of writing skills for for ESL students in particular. Um, uh, one of the sort of controversial things as we move forward with No Child Left Behind is that it's very challenging to, met, to, to assess performance for ESL kids using English language tests. So one of the things that, 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 uh, that, that we're interested in is, is possibly doing native language, Spanish language assessments. But I think you make the point that, you know, that there's pros and cons there because as we've just been discussing, Latinos benefit from having English language skills. Um, and, and so, uh, I mean, I'll just sort of toss out there that um, uh, we, to, to strike the balance between making sure that, that we're providing those English language skills and then, you know, properly doing assessments and, and making sort of native language uh, learning available, uh, it, I think that's a, a challenging balance to strike. But if I may add to that quickly, um, I, I think that we also need to put these issues in perspective. I mean, our overall education is terrible. I mean, I would argue that a good number, if not the majority, of the kids graduating from high school, it doesn't matter if they are Latinos or Anglos, are poorly equipped to write a, a respectable essay, you know, in as far as going into college. The Economist, two issues ago, had a very interesting article about the fact that we are really terrible. I mean, in terms of how well do we invest in preparing our youth to face the challenges you know, that we are confronting as a society. So I think it's important to not fall in the notion that somehow Latinos are underprepared. We are underpreparing our kids across the board. And unless you know, we have a very thorough reform of education policy from K all the way to high school, uh, it's going to be hard for Latinos to really excel given the fact that the existing context is not one that really give us the proper context uh, to excel. We're going to go to a question here at the end of this table. Yo quisiera preguntarle a Yo uh, podría identificarse por favor y su filiación. Lorenzo Zaragoza de Tucson, Arizona, presidente de Fundación México. Eh, yo quisiera preguntarle a Esther Olavarría cómo pudiera en el contexto de su presentación, es decir, los eh, indocumentados viviendo en las sombras, eh, las dificultades para participar eh, por aquello de sus limitaciones en, en idioma, en tiempo, el eh, tener dos trabajos, etcétera. Bueno, déjame tratar de empezar en español, si no, <ríe> voy al inglés. Eh, yo creo que las marchas de, de 2006 fueron muy importantes en, en eh, el impacto eh, que tuvieron, porque los números eran tan, tan grandes en tantas, tantas ciudades. Y, y vinieron, y eh, bueno, eh, fueron en un momento clave durante el debate de inmigración. Y yo creo que, que sí eh, eh, lograron en cambiar de la mente a varios eh, senadores con quien nosotros estamos trabajando. Eh, hoy en día yo no sé si serían tan, tan efectivos como fueron en el 2006, pero en ese, en ese periodo yo creo que sí, que, fueron, que tuvieron un gran impacto. Pero habiendo un motivo fuerte entonces... La participación cívica y política sí se puede lograr. Sí, sí. Aún en las circunstancias de desventaja. Es verdad, verdad. Tiene razón. Ok. Question up here. Could you, I'm sorry, wait for the mic. My name is Eileen Schleff, and right now I'm with my, I have my own consultancy in Creative Alliance Communications. I was part of the Chicano movement, and I came back because of the fact that friends called me and said in 28 years, I left the government 28 years ago, that the numbers have stayed stagnant. And two things have, since I've been back, I, I'm hopeful, but stunned at the fact that there's a silo effect towards programs where we tried to integrate before. Um, there's things happening in the different departments that should be really more cohesive. And then secondly, the, str the way we struggled and some of, some of what we did were actually exemplary in alternative education. I'm wondering if there's a hope for going back and looking at what worked in the past 
that can be tailored to what's happening now? I guess it's then. When, when you yeah. say what worked in the past, though. I'm, I'm talking 60s, 70s. We came out with model education programs, community development, organizing. There are models there, and it was the silo effect has been, and the fact that I've been gone 28 years, and I'm coming back to throw my hat in the ring because the numbers are still the same in the federal government. We worked with Image, and we worked very hard to get the numbers up. So I'm wondering and what by numbers up, you mean numbers of Hispanics in the federal government. In the federal government. And also yeah. in the pools. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not an expert in, in this area, and, in, and I'm not familiar with the efforts that were done. But I, I think you know, you, what you pointed out is something we probably should go back and look at um, and, and, and probably um, bring to the attention of others who, who are looking at how do you expand those numbers. Question, uh, let's go here and then we'll m make our way back there. Jonathan Fox again. A couple of quick factoids and a question. Uh, on the to follow up on, uh, on Oscar's point about the relationship between bilingual education specifically and education more generally, in California, as you, I'm sure we all remember, there was a referendum that rolled back bilingual education. and. That was, I think, in large measure because it became uh, a scapegoat for lousy public education in general. Yeah. And not coincidentally, according to one uh, informed estimate, no more than 15 percent of the then bilingual teachers were actually certified bilingual <laughs> teachers. So folks weren't getting bilingual education, uh, certainly not quality. <clears throat> so also the other factoid is that it wasn't really that long ago <laughs> that we uh, did have a de facto federal immigrant integration policy because in the years after IRCA, after 86, the feds invested something like $4 billion through the states and local governments and community-based organizations and adult education to regularize millions of people, which in retrospect was quite successful. We had something of a recession during those years even and the money was somehow forthcoming under two different parties. And for details, uh, many of you may already know, there's a magnificent MPI book on immigrant integration that has all of that. So it really, really wasn't that long ago. <clears throat> uh, the question is this, and it's about voter turnout, and, and for all of you, but, but particularly because Mark mentioned a, a voter turnout uh, statistics, and the question may be a little bit nerdy, but I want to ask about the reliability of data and the consistency of data on Latino voter turnout trends. because. Here's the thing, it's easy to measure turnout as a percentage of the already registered voters if you think surnames are a good proxy, but measuring, measuring turnout as a percentage of the eligibles assumes that you know how large the citizen population is. And since, for lots of great reasons, the census doesn't ask that question, where does the denominator come from that determines the percentages that we use? How do you say nerdy in Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious. Good question. <laughs> So who's, who are you asking? Well, starting off with Mark, but uh, all of you would have something to say about this because you mentioned, I think, the 49% figure, and is that up or down compared to what, and 49% of whom? Um, yeah, it's, it's too nerdy a question for me. Okay. <laughs> um, which is saying something. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, census does ask foreign-born versus, versus native-born, but, but doesn't ask citizenship. Um, so, yeah, I'm just not sure how, that, how that's calculated because it's, it's, I mean, it, it's not something I'm an expert on. Um, uh, I, mean, I think it's a good question. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I'm sure I can track it down for you. Well, let's um, talk. Yeah, we'll talk. <laughs> but I'm sure Marcelo might have something to add since you're actually directly engaged in these challenges yeah. on the ground. I wanted to show you a couple of... Marcelo, the microphone. The, this is where I brought the PowerPoint. Boom. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I had some numbers there. Go nerds. All right. Uh, Wait a minute. I think you guys set this up. No, right? no, no. no. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's like oh, no, I've got to find it. Um, what I think Mark underscored the challenges is, and if you look at the trends, keep going down, it, it really looks down, down. That's citizenship applications, by the way. That's a, I wanted to dispute that point with Mark that actually the Yaya Soda, the impact of Yaya Soda, where you know it was driven that that's more citizenship numbers keep going, okay. keep going. Oh, I know it's down. Oh, I don't know how it works. That's the last one. But anyway, the point that I want to say, if if you look at the trends from the last elections, um, <coughs> while the numbers went up significantly, we did not. We're still on a trend because you know forty thousand. Latinos turn 18, US, U.S. born Latinos turn 18 every month. You know, we had an incredible numbers of new citizens. So, let me, let me get you that. 
and I got to show a couple. There it is. So the bottom line is actually the number of people who turn out to vote. The second one is eligible register, register voters. And the last one is you know, citizen Latinos, uh, CVAP. So if you look at this, mm -hmm. that's our challenge, that this is getting bigger. So while we're doing great work out there, and I'm not going to debate the great work that we're all doing, <coughs> the eligible population, I think, Mark, you underscored in, in your brief comments, is actually getting bigger, bigger. But I, I wanted to just make one point and, and allow my nerdiness to show, because I wanted to show <laughs> this slide, OK? I wanted to change a little bit the discussion, because the discussion, I guess, it's like, why aren't immigrants voting? What is it about immigrants and they don't vote? So the discussion is about me and my family and all of us. And I argue that the discussion, the discussion should be about what is it in the system inherent why people don't vote? And I, and I have three slides that Matt Barreto put together, so I didn't do this, but Matt Barreto did. And as, if, as you can see, on the left side, on the left side is rate of turnout, and at the bottom, is percent Latinos of counties in Texas. So we mapped out of the 206 general election, right? We said 206 general election, this should be, that's when people actually turn out. So the more Latino the county, the lower the turnout, right? So everybody says Latinos don't turn out, this graph shows it, right? That's, that's what everybody says. So Latinos have some, they don't believe in elections because they don't turn out. Look what happened during the primaries of last year. And you all remember what's going on in March, right? Hillary and Senator Clinton and Senator Obama were deep in combat. The Latino vote was up for grabs. Texas was one of the many goalposts that was set. And actually, the opposite happened when the politicians, the campaign, spent significant amount of dollars. I mean, I think that uh, Terry McAuliffe's actually moved to South Texas. Uh, when you had SEIU, everybody is spending the outreaching, talking. The candidates were speaking on issues that matter to Latinos. Look what happened to the Latino vote. The, the higher the percentage of Latinos in the county, the higher the turnout. Clearly, when Latino voters are outreached and treated like any other voters. I mean, you know how much research is done on soccer moms? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I bet you if you allocate the dollars and how much, I have one more, one more. Oh, oh I just, I just wanted, I wanted to show you what happens to white voters when they're ignored and they're, and they're not outreached. Because I think that's the killer graph. <laughs> Look what happens to them. In the same primary. Remember what was going on in the primary? It was over. McCain was a Republican nominee. Huckabee was still in it, but everybody thought that he was, should resign. So what happened to the white voters in Texas during the same primary? There was no commercials on TV. There was very little mail. Nobody was really cared about Texas. They were virtually ignored. They were not, they were not a factor in this contest. And when white voters are ignored, the same thing happened that happened to Latino voters in 2006. So I argue that Latino voters behave like any other voter. So the discussion should be is, what is it about campaigns? What is it about voter registration? What is it about the institutions that governs elections that, that's not outreaching to Latino voters? I mean, it's simple. If I get invited to a party, I go. But if they don't even give me the address where the party <laughs> is, I'm not sure if I'm going to show up. <laughs> In, in many ways, it goes back to, to something I said earlier. I mean, if, if you are being invested in, you know, if you're being invited actively, then you'll respond. You know, but if there is no investment in you, if you, on the contrary, I mean, you are constantly being given messages that make you feel that you shouldn't even bother, I mean, of thinking of coming, then you're not going to come. I would also add, I mean, that it makes a difference, you know, to what degree a community is itself organized so that he can actually mobilize his assets you know, more deliberately. And three, I believe it does make a difference who's running for office. I mean, is the person running for office inspiring me? I mean, does he relate to my issues? Does she relate you know, to my concerns? If the answer is no, you know, then don't expect I mean, participation. That also makes a heck of a difference.
We have a question. Uh, we were going to go down this table here. Was, was there somebody? Yeah, there's a question there. We keep going down. We'll get to you, sir. Hi, my name is Susana Sandoval. I'm uh, actually attending both as a uh, media professional and also as a nonprofit practitioner and an activist. Um, my fa I, grew, I grew up in media. My family owns a Spanish language TV guide, community newspaper, and Guia Telefonica, Spanish yellow pages. So, um, but I'm, we're coming from a different perspective, more so in media, from uh, Hispanic-owned media versus corporate media. And I think maybe uh, several of the panelists can, can talk to this. We talked about um, media bias in elections and in campaigns and such as that. Um, and then also as a nonprofit practitioner, I'm coming from uh, the viewpoint of edu investment in education and workforce development models. Um, two issues. Um, first one would be, that at least from a nonprofit practitioner, which I've been in the sector for about 20 years now with a background in marketing, program development, and grants, ri grants writing, I think that there's been challenges on the nonprofit sector in general, especially when it comes to um, the capacity building initiatives. And I think that it was a, an opportunity that was missed with the Bush administration, with faith-based initiative in order to get increase into uh, churches. I mean, for voter registration drives and all that has gone through churches, the church system in the United States. And we missed an opportunity. And although there are still, there's still funding in that area, we have the opportunity to create those kinds of mechanisms. I think, Oscar, you might have spoken to, to that, um, at least in some of your initial comments. So I guess my first question has to do with, how do you see a capacity building initiative in the nonprofit sector, which I think is a valid um, opportunity for us to engage on now with the current administration that we have in place here in the United States. Was that question for Oscar or? Oscar initially, but if any of the other. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's a big question with uh, multiple ways of answering it. I mean, I, I would say that you know, I, I mentioned in my comments, I mean, the fact that there is a still rather little uh, investment, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, self, you know, empowerment, self-organizing efforts within uh, the Latino immigrant uh, population. Uh, Esther mentioned that about 75% or so of the undocumented population are indeed Latinos, mostly Mexicans. Yet, I mean, if you really look at, you know, who makes up I mean, the bulk of the organizations that are working on immigration policy reform, I mean, I wouldn't say that 75% are Latino organizations. And, and it is the reflection of the lack of investment. I, I will tell you, I mean, something that we are trying to do from our rather humble, limited you know, perspective. I mean, we've been investing in the last several months in a planning process intended to develop what we call a mobile leadership institute. Because the bottom line is uh, Latino immigrant populations in particular over the last 15 or so years have really spread over, I mean, throughout the U.S. And in many places where our communities are growing, but not to a point of being critical mass, uh, we don't really have, you know, organizations. We don't have uh, any ability to really build in a more uh, consistent manner uh, leadership. And if we expect that these people will come to the big cities, it won't ever happen. So the concept of a mobile leadership institute is actually bringing key areas of knowledge, key areas of skills that if we are able to transfer to Latino immigrant organizations operating in rural areas in the south, southeast of the country, the greater Midwest, uh, as a matter of a medium to long-term investment, you know, within 10 years or so, we will begin to see indeed, you know, the payback of this investment. But it's got to be done now, because if we don't do it now, it will never happen. So that's as little as I, as I can say. Just a final thing. We were dealing also with the fact that um, there is still a digital divide with our community. And I think that that's one of the issues is how, do, how can we implement within our own uh, walk of life um, the impact of a digital divide? I mean, now that the internet has, has hit our reality, how do, how do we go about impacting um, the fact that Latinos really we don't have computers in our homes as much as readily as other communities might do. And how could we create those kinds of mechanisms through our, so our school systems, our academic systems, whether it be at the community college level or um, a local system through either churches or public libraries, et cetera, that would be more access to our community. 
I guess that raises the question, how do you say Twitter in Spanish? Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to take that? Like, I'd just like to Dave. say, uh, actually, Latinos, Latino, young Latinos over-index any population when it comes to downloading from the Internet. Uh, there's, there's a, if anybody wanted, there's a Scarborough report that's free. I'm sorry, uh, say that again. Latinos over-index over any population and downloading from the Internet. <laughs> and... And when I saw that, it actually blew my mind because of, you know, and, and if we put up a website and the Yeah, I Saw That campaign, and I think we had over 100,000 visits to it, and people were downloading the N400, people were downloading the Guide to Becoming Citizen. I was actually surprised of the amount of people actually using it. Uh, not a lot of people might have computers at their homes, but they know how to access the Internet either to a friend or a neighbor, uh, but Latinos are on the Internet. I don't know of any study, any research, I mean, that, that would provide us, you know, with a full picture of it, but we've been conducting over the last several months uh, what we call consultas comunitarias. And one question we've been asking people are, you know, do you have access to Internet? You know, do you have cell phones? And you'll be surprised. Most people do. Now, the problem is they're not using it in the most creative, in the most ambitious of ways. You know, but the fact is they're already paying for a lot of these services. No wonder, I mean, every single Internet provider has, you know, definitely a Spanish available cell, you know, pitch uh, because they know, I mean, who's buying. The question is, can we translate the access to these technology tools into uh, more effective advocacy opportunities? We're going to go to a question uh, in the back. Uh, a gentleman's been waiting, and then we're going to come up. My name is Samar Chatterjee from SAFE Foundation. Uh, there are three issues that were raised uh, on the floor that uh, I have interest in, and one was the national policy on immigrants, Mr. Bada pointed out. I, I do think there is a national policy on immigrants, is to use them as support services and exploit them. So I guess uh, s some of us, the Latinos, are probably more exploited than others, but uh, that is uh, because your numbers are much bigger. And therefore, uh, I'm not a Latino, but we're leaving the push for the immigration reform to you guys <laughs> because <laughs> you have the numbers to do it. The s second was on uh, role model. Uh, Madam, you've pointed out, uh, I, I do think that you need to get more people in as a role model and not the, only the kind that will tow the line of the uh, main Anglo and where there is an entrenched Anglo domination or where there is an entrenched black domination like the, some cities are. And, and so the rest of the country is dominated by Anglo. So uh, we've got to tow the line. Uh, if we do talk like Martin Luther King, we'll be marginalized and no longer considered. So you need to take both kinds of role models and bring them into the system and they will grow. So uh, I guess that's, that's up to the mainstream uh, people who make those decisions, who comes in, who goes out. Thank you. Any I like comments? just in terms of role models, um, just so you know, there's, I used to work for the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials, <laughs> and it's a long name, so it's my name as well. Uh, <laughs> every year we, pub we used to pu we publish, or the organization publishes, I'm no longer with Naleo, publishes an annual directory, and it has steadily grown. There's over 6,000 Latino elected officials across the country in 42 states, and I used to like to point out my favorite one, there was a Latino councilman in Alaska. Um, so in term, in 40, so there's Latino elected officials at one level or another in 42 out of the 50 states. Um, most of them, more than half of them, are in school boards and municipal level. So there is a, there is a bullpen out there, and it's growing. And as you all know, running campaigns and running for office takes money, takes infrastructure, takes institutions. The leadership is there. They're moving up fast. And if you look at California, they're moving up faster than other states. But I wouldn't be surprised if you start seeing Latinos running for office after if we increase the number of Latinos in the state legislature. There's about over 200 of them currently uh, after redistricting. Mm -hmm. and we just a quick comment on the policy of no policy. I mean, many of us are very familiar, especially in our countries of origin, uh, about the policy of no policy. And, and the only comment I would add, I mean, is that the fact that we have about 12 million people, you know, without immigration status, uh, residing in this country, paying taxes, raising families, 
is by no means an accident. I mean, there are many scholars that argue, you know, that the existence of 12 million people is deliberate. I mean, that it is, you know, something that certain interests have found to be, to have actually as a need. I mean, if you have a lot of people who are so vulnerable as to not having immigration status, of course they are going to be easily exploitable. I mean, they're going to be easily uh, subdue, I mean, whenever they want to exercise their labor rights, for example. And so definitely, I mean, I think overcoming that reality uh, becomes a challenge because the, the, no, the no policy policy has actually worked pretty good, I mean, for certain economic interests. Let's uh, go to the question. Um, yes, this, um, yes. Wait for the mic. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Angelica Salas with uh, CHIRLA, the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights of Los Angeles. So one thing that, I was, that I've been struck, because I feel like I've learned a lot of lessons around the civic engagement, is the lack of infrastructure of organizations that actually know how to do uh, um, this work. I, I mean, being a, I, I feel very much a novice ourselves. So I'd like maybe Marcelo to talk about um, you know, your experience in terms of uh, our infrastructure, organizations that are able to mobilize the vote, engage uh, or, um, immigrants civically, Latinos civically. And then for um, Oscar, one of the things that um, we've done is around um, this uh, promotion of uh, democracy schools or escuelas de democracia around the country. One of the things that we're struck is by a lot of the le immigrant leadership and also leadership in immigrant rights organizations. It doesn't matter if they're not um, immigrants, the I um, <coughs> would say the lack of understanding of even how politics works. Like, how does the district, you know, representative uh, in your district uh, votes that it's going to take? You know, when we're talking about 279, that's what it's going to take for immigration reform. But that process. So, if you could talk about that, that'd be very, Absolutely. very in helpful. So, for Mar Marcella on the infrastructure. Yeah. I remember our conversations in 2006 when. First of all, the, the Nats money had dried up. There was no more Soros money. Uh, the number of organizations actually doing naturalizations have pretty much disappeared. Uh, at Naleo, we were having a discussion of ending one of our pillar programs of doing naturalizations. And I remember having these conversations as we know that there's a need. We know that the, the test redesign is coming. We know that the fee increase is coming. There's marches out there. And looking around the country, and really finding, even in L.A., even in L.A. that has one of the, the more infrastructures, it was tough. I think we did a survey, and I think there was something, I don't remember, like 15 organizations that actually knew anything about working within 400s. And if you go across the country, beyond Chicago, with the exception of those from Chicago, because I think the exception in Chicago that you have state money that allows you to, to do some of this, if you look at across the country, New York was the other one that was in dire crisis. Um, and in some communities, there was one or two institutions. The ones that were available were the ones that were for profit um, that were there. And that was, and I think part of our understanding was how do we do this to, to assist the most amount of people fully understanding that there's no infrastructure out there. So we did, our answer was, let's create a media infrastructure. Let's teach people how to apply for citizenship. And I remember, I think, uh, Siomar was very helpful, by the way. <laughs> Had to thank her. Um, in terms of designing the campaign, so we can, I remember doing a, a, a half an hour special where we actually walked people through filling in the N-400, step by step, and trying to identify community centers where people can go, and I think the first time we did it, we can only identify five in L.A., five. Hmm. Um, so we had to build all this additional infrastructure, you know, a phone conference, and then just transferring is, when it comes to voter engagement, the number even drops, because the people actually engaging Latinos beyond the CBOs are really unions, the campaigns, um, and then they do it be for, for very practical, deliberate goals. You know, they have an election that they want to win. As soon as that election is gone, they're out of there. Um, so I think there is an incredible need for infrastructure development, technical assistance, 
uh, and organizations both on the, on, the, on the electoral participation, and I would argue still on that, uh, even though now I spent two years away from Naleo, um, you know, from the media side, when we want to partner in one of our communities, want to find a community partner to actually do a NATS workshop, in some of our states, we do not have a partner that we can actually tell people, this is who can help you fill out an N-400. Just quickly responding to the second question, I would say that there is a huge difference between an organizing strategy that focuses almost exclusively on mobilizing people and an organizing strategy that focuses mostly on getting people really organized and empowered. I mean, and, and I think that that's, a, again, I mean, a very different proposition. I, I find what you're saying to be so true, you know, that most people, most immigrant Latinos, don't really understand the nature of the political system you know, we live in today. For example, for a lot of Mexicanos, they find really hard to understand why you see that immigration policy reform hasn't yet become law. I mean, if Obama is the president and he promised that he was gonna do it within the first year, why is it that he's not done yet? You know, because from their point of view, even though we come from so-called republics, you know, with three different branches of government, just like in the U.S., the truth of the matter is, in Latin America, presidents have humongous power, and they determine pretty much the agenda dictatorially for all practical purposes. So for them, it's hard to understand why Obama hasn't yet delivered. Now, if you begin to explain people that we need, in quotes, I mean, 279, I mean, to use the, you know, Reform Immigration for America campaign, they don't get it, you know, because they say, well, wait a minute, you know, Democrats have 59 members in the Senate. They're only missing one, so what's the big deal? <laughs> you know, <laughs> they don't understand that there are 13, at least 13, you know, senators, Democrats, that are a hard sell, I mean, to bring to the side of immigration policy reform of the kind that at least we would definitely appreciate, and let alone the House. I mean, people say, what's the big deal? You know, they have 256 Democrats in the House, so what's the problem? Again, I mean, there is a lot of work to be done. Uh, I'll tell you, finally, I mean, a little anecdote. I was in Omaha uh, recently, and I was asking a bunch of people who consider themselves, for all practical purposes, leaders. You know, and I asked them, you know, do you all support comprehensive immigration reform? And they all raised their hand. And then I asked, what each of you understand that comprehensive immigration reform is all about? They had no clue. <laughs> you know, and so we have to go beyond, you know, the obvious, be beyond the superficial dimension of things and really get people involved in a more meaningful way, truly building knowledge and uh, skills that can allow, particularly Latino, you know, Mexican, Central Americans, and so immigrants become much better equipped to be able to be agents of change, agents of civic, you know, and political participation here and elsewhere. Thank you. You know, if I could just note something. I'm sorry, go ahead. I just ahead. wanted to add that I, I wouldn't just say it's Latinos who, who lack that understanding <laughs> in, in the number of years <laughs> that I, I worked in the Congress. We had so many uh, people that would come in and, and, and you'd have to start from square one to talk about how the legislative process worked and, and what was an effective lobbying visit. And, and it was all across the board. People lack that understanding. I, I was going to say there's a fascinating study of 1999 where they asked, where they surveyed uh, Mexican students, ninth graders uh, in Mexico, uh, how they felt laws should be passed and decisions made, and less than 40 percent said that it should be go through a deliberative representative body. Uh, the overwhelming majority, upwards of 60 percent, said the experts should handle it. I mean, there's a conditioning of sorts, a political conditioning that somehow has ripple effects, I think, in this country. Go ahead. Well, just one other point that bears emphasis on, on this uh, organizing gap is uh, the extent to which the other side on the immigration issue doesn't confront this problem and the extent to which they have a much more focused uh, agenda that, that, that the, you know, the broad sort of anti-CIR coalition agrees on, which is no, you know, no amnesty, uh, and the extent to which they're very um, well versed in how to how to conduct political contacts and to organize their uh, you know their movement. So uh, it, it really uh, I think that the gap is is quite a bit larger than the numbers suggest it should be. Um, 
Yep. There was a question, a uh, couple of questions. Let's go there and then we'll move our way up here. Yes. Thank you. My name is Olia Esteves and I'm a journalist from Mexico that represents several publications. I have two brief questions. Number one is yesterday after uh, President Obama met with a number of um, uh, congressmen and, law and um, senators, he referred several times to the need of tightening the uh, border, securing more the border, and as a precondition for legalization. I wanted to know, I mean, in my view, the border is pretty tight. What else is he planning to do? He knows that he has to do this because otherwise he's probably not going to get the votes, which are not there according to Emmanuel. So I just wonder uh, what um, Oscar mentioned, um, a bill that would be accepted for us, meaning the immigrant community and the Latinos, uh, what it would be accepted uh, in terms of tightening the border? I mean, I know that the mood or the wall was rejected. Um, so I don't know what else can he do or he's planning to do maybe in the meeting yesterday there were some ideas on how to tighten the border with Mexico farther. My second question has to do with the Mexican government role. The Mexican government role uh, was big during the Fox administration and according to the general consensus it backfired. It was uh, seen as uh, and also used by the uh, Ludovs and company as uh, in, in intervention into domestic affairs, the immigration reform is seen as a pure domestic issue. So is there anything or any role the Mexican government should or can play that can be productive? Um, I can say a little bit about that. Um, uh, on the second question, um, I, I would be reluctant to, to say that the initial conversation between Fox and Bush backfired. I think actually that, that President Fox and, and his, you know, the whole enchilada um, uh, conversation was was very influential in, in sort of propelling the, the U.S. debate forward, and that that process got derailed largely because of the 9/11 attacks, and 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 things got th it got derailed for reasons I think mostly unrelated to Mexico's role, and, and sort of in spite of Mexico's role, um, and uh, I think that that um, Mexico may have been perceived as sort of unhelpful. Later, during the, 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 the big marches, you know, there were, there were critics who felt like people were waving too many Mexican flags. But I, I mean, I actually don't think that, that, that anything that the Mexican government did was unhelpful. And I think, on the other hand, that there's a lot of very productive conversations that are going on between the United States and Mexico uh, around the border and around, you know, managing uh, removals and, and cooperating on uh, drug enforcement and, and, and uh, the uh, Mexico's uh, war, the Mexico's counter narcotic efforts, and I think that those are generally seen as quite successful and, and helpful to the process. Um, uh, um, so, and, and in terms of, of what Mexico can do, my understanding is that that those conversations. Uh, John Morton made a presentation just the other day uh, at, at at an event uh, at, at the Migration Policy Institute help sponsor, and, and he was describing. Um, ongoing efforts to, to coordinate things like uh, the, the various components of U.S. enforcement policy, both at the border through CBP and, and uh, removals through ICE, that, uh, to work collaboratively with Mexico to make sure that those processes happen smoothly. And I, I think all of that makes immigration reform easier to accomplish eventually. Um, uh, and then I forgot what the first question was. I'm sorry, but I had something to say if, on that. If as well. I could address uh, oh, the border. Yeah, right. the, the, the president yesterday spoke about the need to have legislation that's balanced. That can t we have done significant work with respect to the border, but there's still things that can be done, and we need to look at those things and, and, and include them in the legislation. In addition to interior enforcement measures, along with. Um, Looking at a solution for the undocumented. Looking I'm sorry. At the what else could be done, though? Mm -hmm. what, are well, you, what are we talking about? We're, we're looking at right now the the, the drug and and money and violence um, occurring at, at the border. So so there there's work that still there's a lot that has been done, but there's more that can be done. There's questions of technology. You know, using. Uh, 
putting in place additional technology, not getting away from the idea of the fence. I think most um, experts agree that the, the fence is, is a political um, issue and it's not an effective enforcement issue. Um, looking at, at the northern border, we've ignored the northern border. So those are the kinds of things, but, but also more looking at interior enforcement issues, and I think the big part of that is going to be putting in place an effective employment verification system that will allow employers to, to um, ensure they have a, we a legal workforce. Uh, but those in conjunction with uh, the legalization programs and, and the other benefits things. In the end, any legislation is going to have to bring Republicans and, and Democrats, and you're not going to achieve that unless you include all of these measures together. Mm -hmm. uh, just a couple of things that I would add. Uh, first, on the Mexico government um, side, First of all, I actually find ironic that you know people were at the time critical of uh, Castañeda pushing the concept of the whole enchilada. But if you really look at what has happened with the immigration reform movement from 2003 forward, we have really embraced you know, the concept of the whole enchilada. I mean, when people say that we have to pass comprehensive immigration reform <laughs> as opposed to passing piecemeal, essentially what we are saying is we want the full enchilada. I mean, and so I, I find that, again, I mean, interesting that at the time it was the object of criticism, but in many ways we have embraced it. Uh, second of all, I mean, I think that part of the, what, what makes hard the question of, you know, what do immigrant communities want, you know, by way of immigration policy reform, is that let, let's keep in mind that the political context has been steadily moving more and more to an anti-immigrant, you know, an anti-Mexican, uh, if you want, position. And, and let me remind you, I mean, in 1996, we passed, frankly, a horrible immigration policy reform law that changed for the worst, you know, the standards by which we foreigners are, mo are measured, I mean, in U.S. society. And if you recall, the year after 1996, there was unity among immigration reform advocates to go after the changes under the campaign known as Fix 96. Well, we haven't fixed anything, I mean, essentially, since 1996, hardly anything. And, and I would say that, you know, the fact that there has been um, an effort to homogenize the immigrant rights uh, movement, the immigration advocacy community, under a demand that while it sounds nice, it doesn't really tell us with precision what are we talking about. I'm talking about comprehensive immigration reform. It's become rather difficult because I, for example, emphasize a lot, you know, with immigrant communities, what do you think is actually broken of today's immigration law? And people tell me, well, I think that the weights are horrible. You know, I think that the, that the fact that we cannot find ways to, to advance into legal permanent residence if you happen to be in the U.S. without documents. Uh, I think that the fact, I mean, that people have to, uh, face uh, either the choice of applying for a relatives, I mean, and, and face the three, 10 year bar. I mean, that's a problem. So to me, those are the issues that really explain what immigrant communities would want, you know, by way of immigration policy reform. Now, are we to get that? I mean, I doubt it. I mean, just looking at, for example, Senator Schumer's outline from two days ago, three days ago, I didn't see much of what immigrant communities really care about, I mean, in that particular outline. And again, I mean, it boils down to a reality. It's important to be clear about what we want, but at the same time, we need to be realistic about what can be obtained. I mean, and this goes back to a question that we are talking about here as the underlining issue, which is power. To what degree are we, as immigrants, are we, as Latinos, more powerful today than we were, let's say, back in 1986? We don't have time to go into that debate, I mean, but that'll be an interesting debate to have. Mm -hmm. Question here, and then make our way back. Yes, uh, and then, uh, actually, uh, yeah, no, 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 uh, her first, okay. then you. Gracias. Me llama un poco la atención, should I speak in English or? Um, Whatever you want. Just make sure you identify okay. yourself, please. Um, 
Me llama un poco la atención. Could eh, you identify yourself, I'm sorry. It's okay. Okay. Lourdes Gobella de Omaha, Nebraska, de eh, Ollas. Eh, este énfasis de nuevo sobre interior enforcement. Eh, and it concerns me, so I'm going to switch to English a second. It concerns me deeply coming from the interior. Um, because I think um, that we've been there, done that, doing Doris Meisner and her, um, <laughs> um, her um, stay at the uh, immigration office. Um, and <coughs> I wonder how much of a, of a critical perspective is being employed to understand what this means. Uh, and why is this becoming possibly the new politically acceptable answer to enforcement? Um, and I would just throw out a couple of questions because this has been brought up before in the interior, which is this is the place, uh, these are the places where part especially uh, where, where the infrastructure, where the organizational infrastructure is particularly weak. So we were just talking about, you know, if Los Angeles and, you know, in Chicago, you can imagine places like North Carolina or Nebraska or Missouri or yeah. Iowa, um, where labor is particularly vulnerable. This is primarily Mexican, Central American labor migration with all the implications that scholars and practitioners understand about that type of migration. So, um, but this is also a, a place where, of course, new awakenings are taking place. Um, so my question is, what's the calculus here? And how far have politicians thought about the impact that this is going to have, including Democrats and their reelection uh, potential? I'll, I'll say one thing about that, which is that, um, <coughs> I think on a, on a very basic level, uh, we live in a world in which more people are interested in coming to the United States than we will be issuing visas to come here. So even after comprehensive immigration reform and <clears throat> even after we legalize the 12 million who are here and fix the visa system, there will still be people who want to come here who don't have visas. Uh, and I think it is very widely accepted both among policy analysts and among politicians that part of the infrastructure that we have to have in place to, to that, that, that we have good, valid public policy goals in, in, in the United States determining who comes and, and discouraging people from coming and, and living here um, out of status, and that, that having a, uh, you know, uh, an infrastructure in place to allow employers to distinguish between legal and undocumented workers and to hold them accountable for, for only employing uh, legally authorized workers is, is going to be part of the policy package. And that, you know, that's in the long run, that's sort of a, val that, that that's a valid goal. Um, so I think that's a lot of what people mean when they talk about interior enforcement, is to create an infrastructure that, that we don't currently have an infrastructure that allows employers to distinguish between legal and undocumented workers. On one hand, that means that that good faith employers aren't always able to, to make sure that they're hiring legal immigrants, uh, and that bad faith employers are able to knowingly hire undocumented workers and then and, and, and not be held accountable for doing that and to exploit them. So both immigrants and U.S. workers lose under that system. Um, so I think we, again, we have a real public policy interest in creating uh, a verification system that works. And then on the enforcement side, um, does that mean that we need to, uh, well, on the, and I think that any verification system that we can sort of get our minds around will still require an enforcement system to back it up because even if employers have the perfect capacity to, to distinguish between legal and undocumented workers, um, they'll also have the capacity to go around that system and to choose to, to hire people off the books and, and so on. So um, that's going to create a public policy interest in, in having enforcement and, and having, you know, a, a labor department or immigration department that that um, that uh, polices against that. I think you raise a good point that that it also highlights the the uh, our interest in ensuring that immigrant communities and 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 labor communities 
uh, have a presence in those communities and, and can work to protect worker rights. And, and, we, and as we think about designing a verification system, that we design it in a way that ensures that, that workers have a, a stake in that process and it doesn't uh, create opportunities for employer misuse and abuse. And, and there's real concerns about our, the, the verification system that we have now that, that it, it creates those opportunities. So um, the point is not, well, we just need to make you verify universal and that's going to solve all our problems, um, but, but that we can design a verification system that, that gives employers tools to distinguish in legal and undocumented workers while also uh, giving workers a stake in that system and, and, and labor advocates a stake in that system. I would agree with interior enforcement has become shorthand is is actually shorthand for an employment verification system. There are other aspects to interior enforcement, but that is the key aspect. And as has been pointed out, we have done a lot on the border. There's still some more that could be done, but we've done a lot more than we had done in in the the past ten years. And in again, achieving that balance that needs to be achieved for passage of an immigration reform bill. You're going to have to have an enforcement piece along with the legalization backlog reduction piece. And interior enforcement is becoming the enforcement piece of that. And that's really what was missing during the, the 1990s. I mean, you're right that, that during the 90s we targeted Nebraska for worksite raids, mm -hmm. but we didn't create tools for, for doing effective employer verification. And we didn't have a good system in place to make sure that, that employers had access to legal workers. So that's the other big piece that, that, has, to be, that has to be there along with, with a good verification system. Just a couple of things to add. I mean, for, first, I think that the interior enforcement piece, e even if we you know, hone in on the fact that we're talking essentially about employment verification, there are at least two, two problems that I see. On one hand, uh, let's face it, I mean, more Latino immigrants have been going to jail. You know, the Pew Hispanic Center study recently released, I mean, told us very clear and loud, I mean, that we are increasingly becoming, you know, the largest uh, population in prisons. Now, interestingly, I don't know if you paid attention, the, the terms that we are serving are actually on average five months. Why? Because many of the Latinos that are coming through the prison system are immigrants, and they've been offered a deal. If they declare themselves guilty, Rather than serving five years, you know, for let's say uh, identity theft, they only serve five months. But they're gone for good, never to ever come back, I mean, to the US. That's a problem. I mean, because if you look at what private jails are being built right now and where, it's very scary. I mean, to think of a regime, you know, where we try to implement uh, employment verification, and if you don't comply, the consequence may be you are arrested and potentially placed in jail. And so that's very, very scary. I mean, as far as I can tell. Uh, second of all, I mean, I think that this begs the question of, you know, what do, it goes back to also the earlier question about Mexico, you know, what can Mexico do? I mean, the bottom line is, for as long as the social and economic asymmetries that exist between Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean versus the U.S. remain what they are now, you can rest assured. I mean, that there will be more people wanting to come to the U.S. even if they don't have a visa. And so the, the real responsible humane solution is working with civil society, Mexican government, at every level of government, you know, municipal, state, and federal, to bring about new economic development strategies. Because clearly, the economic and trade policies that we've been pushing the last 20 years have not produced the results that we were promised. So we better engage in that other area of the challenge if we are to bring a humane balance between the reality of global migration in today's world and our desire to exercise sovereign control over our borders. Uh, part of the question was a political um, a calculus, though, on the part of elected officials in, in dealing or confronting this. Anybody have a, um, anything to say about that? I think one piece of the political calculus that Senator Schumer has talked about over and over again and that other people agree with is uh, there's not going it, to, it's very difficult to imagine achieving a comprehensive reform bill that doesn't convince moderates that, that it includes effective enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the political calculus is that, that, um, that moderates and, and, and lots of, and so, so it has to include effective enforcement. And then I also think that 
that if we find ourselves five or ten years from now, five or ten years after we do a legalization and, and do comprehensive immigration reform, and that it doesn't include effective enforcement, and that we, you know, we confront five or ten million undocumented immigrants living and working in the United States again, that the backlash that we would confront then would be, uh, you know, really quite frightening. And, and was, to make clear, uh, mm. moderates include Democrats and Republicans. It's yeah. it's both of them. We have sizable <clears throat> number of Democrats who won't support legislation unless it includes strong enforcement. I was going to take it from a political perspective. All the polling that I've seen for candidates, when they talk about immigration, if they go any path to citizenship, they have to talk enforcement. Actually, they have to lead. If you, if you look at the memos that these candidates get, they have to lead with enforcement. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what they're taught. That's ingrained. So from a political perspective, the posters are telling them, if you don't talk about enforcement, you're going to lose the community. You can't even get to, to, to legalization or any other conversation. You don't even call it, call it earn. And, and, but enforcement has to be part even on the pro-immigrant side of the, of the, of the equation. Mm -hmm. They're all taught. It's ingrained on them. And just listen to them. That's what they're taught in terms of their talking points. And, and even with respect to legalization, we have learned that you need to frame it in an enforcement um, exactly. Stance. You require. require individuals to become legal instead of, Back of permit the line. them, allow yeah. them, require them, and that's yeah. what resonates. Which, at least to me and, and leaders in Latino immigrant communities, you know, what, what we just heard, I mean, exemplifies very much, you know, what I said earlier. I mean, how the political spectrum has been moving so steadily, you know, to a point where we have to speak of enforcement, otherwise you're not credible. And 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 the bottom line is. I mean, I really believe that for a lot of politicians, they wouldn't mind, you know, if we have indeed ways of securing the legality of people, immigrants, I mean, working in the U.S., so long as they don't really change the political equation in terms of who become voters. And, and so I, I am concerned, and we are yet to, be, to, to see the details, as to what kind of legalization program, you know, gets to be included in a bill that will eventually be filed. But if it is, you know, a, a provision that does not promptly and uh, easily enable people to access legal permanent residency, which is the precondition to ever be able to become a U.S. citizen, that becomes problematic because we may end up with a very large population of Latino immigrants who are only legalized to work in this country whether those that are already here or those who may come in the future, because let's face it, the immediate term debate may blind us, thinking that we don't need these foreign workers. Bottom line is if you look beyond the next 5, 10, 20 years, there is no way in hell that we can function in this country without significant increases in foreign workers, because the bottom line is the demographic reality of the nation is such that we would end up you know, with a bunch of elderly people who need to be kept up, and who's going to do that, you know, if it is not foreign workers. So these are some of the difficult issues that have to do with what we're talk talking about. We have less than five minutes. We're going to try and squeeze in two more questions. Remember, you will always be able to come and approach some of these uh, panelists afterwards if you have other questions. Uh, this gentleman here and then um, at the very end corner table there. Yeah. Hi. Very good. It was very in My name is Shelton Davis. I, I, I worked for many years and uh, I've been working for the National Museum of the American Indian on uh, Mayan migrants here to the United States. There's a million Mayan migrants here from Mexico and Guatemala. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the questions I have uh, is uh, I think it's important that we call these Latino but there, there are really so many indigenous. In fact, I got a book today called The Indigenous World 209. I got last week, actually, from the International Working Group on Indigenous Affairs in Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, which is publishes every year, and almost every one of the communities in Latin America has so much indigenous people that are migrating, and that people are worried too with climate change. And the, uh, and the, and was the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples has said that immigration should be taken into account of indigenous peoples. Sheldon, so, was there a, a question? Were you so my question is, should we be taking into account indigenous peoples, especially that we voted against the UN Declaration on Indigenous Rights, but maybe we're going to be in favor of the OAS Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and that we should look at migrants being Indigenous people, because most of the poverty in Latin America 
is indigenous peoples. At least in my case, I would defer any comment to a later panel where we have a, a, an expert among us here that knows very well, uh, Gaspar Rivera Salgado, who may well tackle that question mar much more uh, knowledgeably than I could. <laughs> a huge issue on things like ESL, the, the non-Spanish the, the non speaking Latino uh, immigrant population. Let's go to the question, final question here on the end. <laughs> Uh, yes, Anna O'Leary from Tucson, Arizona. Um, one of the challenges, and I uh, would hope that um, either um, the um, either Mark or Miss um, um, Olavaria would uh, maybe address this, is uh, with regard to the enforcement, internal enforcement. Um, is there any dialogue crea been created to discuss the root causes of immigration? rather than just the uh, enforcement aspects? And um, is there any, any way of looking at immigration that is not conflated with issues of violence and, and, and drug enforcement, which is, in the opinion of many people, separate, but at the same time related, uh, and both due to the causes of, again, enforcement measures? OK. Any? Takers. I, th I think that, that um, you know, as, as uh, Oscar said, uh, we know that, that um, economics drive a lot of undocumented immigration and the, and the inequality between, between the U.S. And, and immigrant sending states. Uh, from a policy perspective, it's challenging to use development as a tool to, to reduce pressure for immigration because it's a very long-term strategy uh, and there's not good uh, successful models that, that we that, that exist that we can just take off the shelf and uh, you know how you target money to communities of origin but but certainly all of those things um, are part of the policy conversation uh, and and things that I think policymakers and, and analysts uh, understand that that those dynamics should be part certainly as, as we think about a truly comprehensive solution I think absolutely that that's that's part of the conversation um, you know the, the political uh, the politics of putting that at the center of comprehensive immigration reform is challenging because uh, it involves investing a lot of money in, in long-term development goals and communities of origin. The short-run effects of those investments may be economic churning and may be to produce more <coughs> short-term pressure for immigration. Uh, that, I mean, that's essentially what we've seen in the NAFTA period is that mm -hmm. these long-term investments in, in development have produced short-term churning. Um, so I think that that the poli the politics of immigration reform mean that that uh, it will include uh, both sort of short term answers and and longer term solutions, including visa reform. But but hopefully um, investment in, in communities of origin is 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 right at the middle of that conversation. Marcelo, to get to that policy discussion, we got to change the political debate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to underscore that mm -hmm. we got to change the political debate and to get to those policy questions and because the context is you know you got talk radio that's out screaming us mm -hmm. you have you know cable tv that have you know 24 7 they're framing the debate and the discussion that we're having a lot of times is just amongst ourselves mm -hmm. i mean i would assume that everybody in this room is pro-immigrant so we need to expand the discussion to change the nature of the political conversation to get to those policy discussions mm -hmm. i have a Final question for us that um, the timeline for immigration reform at this point and um, starting with the Senate uh, and with the role of, um, of people like these, um, what the role is for immigration advocates or, 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 or researchers? I mean, what's our role in that, in that process? Well, the uh, timeline. Can, can I just yeah. say one thing before you go into that that relates to the previous question? If we look back, at how much money, our money, your money and my money, has been spent in border and immigration enforcement since at least 1994 to the present day. I tell you, if we had only, if we had used half of that money to create a revolving uh, long fund to support a small, micro, medium enterprise development, in Mexico and Central America, run by a consortium of you know, 
the specialist on micro lending, we would have achieved a lot more in terms of controlling migratory flows than we have so far. But I totally agree with Marcelo. I mean, we have to change the pervasive narrative that we all have allowed to dominate. And that implies reaching out to unusual you know, allies and really getting them uh, to come uh, uh, to a better understanding of the challenge that we face. Thank you. And, and I think that's, that's one thing that all of you can do, going back to part of the, the question that was asked, what can people do? The, the issue of addressing root um, causes of migration in the past few years in the immigration debate has really just gotten lip service. Um, people all recognize that we need to do it, but nothing has been done. It, nothing has been included in any of the pieces of legislation. And I'm afraid that the same thing is going to happen this time around. So, um, You mean it, in four years we're still going to be sitting here and not um, you know, unless people engage and, and, and raise that issue to the forefront, it's not going to happen. And it takes, you know, experts like, like all of you in the room in this area and looking at ideas like the, the idea that Oscar um, just mentioned. Um, and I wouldn't disagree with you with respect to enforcement. Um, timeline. It's anybody's guess, really. Um, there's a lot of debate as to which chamber is going to go first. Um, a lot of the immigration advocates would like to see the House go first because the House has not acted. Um, in the past, they have a very uh, much more controlled process. You can get a bill to the floor, you can control the number of amendments, and you can get a bill off the floor quickly. In the Senate, it's, it's a free-for-all. Um, and, 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 um, but the problem is that House leadership has said they're not going to go first until the Senate passes a bill. They're not going to expose their members to the difficult votes that immigration reform would entail. So it looks like in all likelihood it will be the Senate that will proceed first. Um, Senator Schumer has stated I mean, a few days ago that he wants to bring a bill to his committee um, sometime in the fall. And that was an, uh, a theme you heard at, at the President's meeting yesterday. Everybody thinks that we need to go with what's called regular order. So go through the committee process first like we did in 2006. Uh, best case scenario, and this is again, it, there are many factors we need to see how health care reform goes, we need to see how energy goes, we need to see how the Sotomayor nomination goes, all of that has to go first. Best case scenario is that the, the Senate could, committee could mark up a bill sometime in the fall. Um, whether we'll have time on the floor to get that bill to the floor, it's unclear. Um, you know, under, again, best case scenario, we could get the Senate to pass a bill this year and then conference something with the House early next year. That'd be great. But there are so many different factors, so many things that could happen that we haven't even thought about. So who knows? And with that, thank you, panelists. Thank you all for your questions.